Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, hover your mouse over my name, Dan Wilton, and a menu will appear to send me a private chat message. Below the participant list is the chat area. The chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post your responses to anything that might come up during the presentation. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions to our presenter at the end of the talk. After the presentation, we'll release the microphone for questions. To use your microphone, click the microphone button once to begin speaking and again to disconnect when you've finished your question. Do remember to keep your microphone off when you're not speaking to avoid any feedback or background noise. Today's slides are now available on our site at cider.athabascau.ca, and a full recording will be posted about an hour after the session ends. There you'll also find our archive of past sessions and an open call for potential presenters for our 2018-19 season. We welcome established researchers and emerging voices, so if you have research you would like to share with our CIDR audience, drop us a line. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the June session of the 2017-18 CIDR session series from the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. For today's session, the final session of the season, we're pleased to have two of our most popular voices and consistent supporters of CIDR, Drs. Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte with the latest installment in our ongoing mini-series of State of the Nation reports on Canadian K-12 online learning. Michael Barbour is Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Touro University, California in Vallejo, California. He has been involved with K-12 online and blended learning in a variety of countries for two decades as a researcher, teacher, course designer, and administrator. His research focuses on the effective design, delivery, and support of K-12 online learning, particularly for students located in rural jurisdictions, and in recent years he has advocated for policies designed to promote effective forms of K-12 online and blended learning. Randy Labonte has served as a senior level executive for over 30 years in the education sector. He was the lead consultant for seven years at the BC Ministry of Education, involved in field work leading to the development of policy, agreements, and e-learning standards. He helped to develop, pilot, and implement the quality review process for BC online K-12 schools, and is now the Chief Executive Officer for the Canadian e-learning network, and teaches in the online learning and teaching diploma for Vancouver Island University, as well in the Ken E Learn Online Teacher PD program. He is passionate about online and technology supported blended learning. I'm now passing the microphone to Michael and Randy. Everyone welcome Drs. Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte. Good morning. Randy, did you want to give the mic a try now that you think it's going? Yeah, let's just uh, make sure. You can hear me all right? coming through loud and clear. Wonderful. So we've got our tech figured out here. Um, thanks, Dan, for that introduction. And uh, it's good to see everybody here. And for all of those who are watching the uh, recording, this is the uh, 10th anniversary edition of the report, or at least 2017 was. We are currently uh, just getting ramped up now for the 2018 report. Uh, we've got most of our sponsors lined up, and uh, we'll just be starting to finalize the uh, instruments with them um, probably next week, we're hoping. So for those of you who are involved in uh, different ministries, and I see a couple of folks here from Manitoba and Donald and Chris, um, you should be getting the uh, surveys from us probably in about 10 days or so for the 2018 report. Um, and as Dan mentioned, this is one that we've actually been doing with CIDR for quite some time. I went back and looked through my notes, and I think this is the uh, either seventh or eighth time that we've presented at CIDR. So um, we're hitting about 70 or 80 percent of the uh, annual reports that have come through on this um, 
uh, on this medium. So we, we thank CIDR for the venue uh, that they've provided over the years. Um, in addition to, and I just mentioned we were getting the sponsors to get ready for the 2018 report. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the sponsors we had for the 2017 report. And, and many of these have been longtime sponsors uh, for us. Uh, Can He Learn is the uh, main outlet through which the report is published. Uh, the Manitoba First Nations Education Resource Center uh, essentially provides the copy editing and printing and uh, actual publishing of it, I guess the, the physical stuff that goes on. And I note Adrian in the audience here, uh, before the Manitoba First Nations Education Center got involved, Open School BC performed that function for us and Adrian was our main contact for a couple of years. So I'm glad to see him in the audience. Uh, the rest, uh, the Center for Francophone uh, Education at Distance, uh, CFED, ADLC, uh, LEARN, which is based in Quebec, and the Virtual High School in Ontario, and I see Sarah here representing them today, uh, have all provided generous contributions uh, both to allow us to do the research and this year in particular allowing us to do some of the translation work, which we hadn't done in the past. So just to give you, I guess, a sense or an overview of the way the study has evolved over the years. As you can see, for the most part, we've tried to vary the way in which we've gotten information. Uh, so to see this particular methodology over a 10-year period, uh, in many cases in the early years, we relied significantly upon key stakeholders, or KS, and document analysis, or DA. Um, as the report has evolved throughout the years, you see that more and more we've been getting information directly from the ministries and then supplementing that with stuff from either documents or from key stakeholders. And while in some years we've only included, as you can see across the board in many cases, just MOE in many instances, uh, I want you to understand that it isn't just a Ministry of Education report. So we are actually supplementing this from information that we're getting through the individual program surveys that we send out each year, uh, through the network that's been established with the Canadian e-learning network, as well as uh, basically the individuals that Randy and I have made uh, those individual research connections with over the years. So what we've tried to do in this methodology table, and it's included in the report as well, is provide the primary source of information. And then we use other sources, oftentimes ones that aren't mentioned here, to verify or clarify, or in some cases, refine the ministry perspective compared to what's actually happening on the ground, which for those of you in the audience who, who are listening that are practitioners know that sometimes things don't quite work out exactly the way in which um, things would seem uh, from a ministry perspective. So. In addition to that, we've had for most of the last half of the report that we've been doing, so most of the last five or six years, we've also been doing an individual program survey where we essentially try to get the individual programs across the country. And we've been able to identify approximately 285 of them that we contact every year to see if they, for them to provide some additional information on a program by program basis because in many jurisdictions that's not tracked at the provincial level. So finding out what programs are doing, getting a sense as to the size and scope of their programs compared to the other ones in the province and then in some cases extrapolating those numbers so that we can get a better idea as to the actual level of participation. Um, and, but as you can see, you know, when we're looking nationally, uh, we tend to get in that 20% range uh, in terms of a response rate. Now, some provinces, obviously the ones with smaller programs, oftentimes, um, or smaller number of programs, we get a much more a higher proportion of responses. But uh, overall, it tends to be about 20%. And it's hovered in that sort of 15 to 25% range pretty much every time we've done this. Report. So that's sort of a sense as to, to where the information that we use comes from every year. So looking across the country, um, one of the things that we ask about uh, is to try to figure out how 
um, K-12 online and distance education in particular, to a lesser extent blended learning, is regulated. And as you can see from this chart here, there is some form of regulation in most provinces, um, with the exception of, if you look at it, Newfoundland, Quebec, and Saskatchewan, um, and the federal jurisdictions, so those programs that fall under the um, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit category that would fall under what used to be um, ANSI uh, in terms of a federal department. There, we have some sense as to um, you know what's happening here. Now, on the legislative front, in many cases, um, what we're looking at is simply a reference to distance education in the Education Act or the Schools Act, although in some cases, it is very detailed. So to use the example of uh, Nova Scotia, um, it's actually part of the teacher's collective agreement that the government has with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. And that is you know, a, a significant act that goes through the um, legislature. Similarly, in the case of, of BC, that um, you know, there are significant clauses in both the uh, Schools Act and the Independent Schools Act that focus upon uh, distance education, but in most other cases, it is literally a clause that says distance education is under the purview of the Minister of Education and kind of leaves it at that. And that's why these other things that we've got in place here uh, tend to be so important. Um, as you can see, the most other common method of, of regulating uh, e-learning across the country is through policy handbooks. And in some cases, these policy handbooks are updated on an annual basis. Uh, in other cases, they tend to stay static for a while and then are released as you know, a significant update. And I see in the chat window there that uh, Donald is mentioning that the uh, Manitoba policy handbook is being updated. And uh, I think that's been a couple of years in the works now. And I'm guessing that you're getting ready to release it um, now that it's gone through all of the approval processes. because. You know, things that have to work their way through the ministry, um, both in terms of time when you go through the levels of approval that are required, but also getting a sense as to what's happening on the ground so that you can shape a series of policies that are going to accommodate the different types of variations that are actually happening in the field is, is not an easy task and oftentimes requires uh, you know, multiple revisions over significant periods of time to try to accommodate all those different models. Um, looking ahead now to the levels of activity or the nature of activity, I guess, to start with, um, this has been fairly static throughout, really for the most part, I'm going to say the last seven years. There has been some change in time over the length of the study, so over the past 10 years, but for the most part, what you see is in Atlantic Canada, with the exception of Prince Edward Island, there tends to be a single province-wide program that provides offerings. Um, in the north and in PEI, they use programs from other provinces. And then as you go across, it actually sort of goes back and forth between either district-based programs, and we use the term district as sort of an all-encompassing thing. Um, in some provinces, their districts, and some their school boards, and some their district school boards or uh, school board districts. But we just use the generic term district to encompass all of those. But um, you can see that you get the combination of a provincial program along with district-based programs, or just district-based programs, um, sort of going back and forth as you go from Quebec westward, uh, spending back and forth. And, and that stayed fairly consistent as we've done this study. In terms of the numbers that we're looking at, uh, and this is always, I guess, one of the more fascinating parts of the, the study for me to see the actual level of activity. Um, it's remained fairly consistent as we've gone through in terms of the number of distance and online students. So what you see here is the level of number of students involved in e-learning. And that includes both the distance and online students, as well as the blended students. And this is the first year we've presented the statistics like this. 
Um, historically, we've just looked at the online and distance students that are involved in the system. Um, so this was the first time we tried to incorporate some of the blended ones, which is why if you've been following along with the report, we've tended to be in the 5% range um, over the last number of years, usually somewhere between 5.3 and 6.2, uh, whereas this year you can see it's 15.7, and it's not quite a, a fair comparison looking at this particular one. Now, if you look at this table, this just provides the look at the number of distance and online students. And as you can see from this table, now this is much more consistent with the numbers that we've been providing over the, the last few years. So you can see the overall percentage involvement across the country is 5.4%. And one of the things that when I do these presentations, I always try to underscore is the fact that that is at least 5.4%. So in many of the jurisdictions, and you can kind of see it there based upon the fact that you see a tilde to indicate approximately in front of many of the jurisdictions there, actually almost half of them to be honest with you, um, you know, because those are our estimates. And depending upon the number of responses we get to the individual program survey, depending on how good the data is from the Ministry of Education, um, in some cases, you know, that's, a, you know, that approximate is a pretty close approximate, uh, so a pretty good estimate, and, and in some cases it really is just a, a, an educated guesstimate, and the one I'll use as probably the best example here is the case of Alberta, um, where, you know, that really is our best guess, and I use that terminology very specific. Where some other jurisdictions, and I'd point out the, the two ends of the country, British Columbia and, and Newfoundland, as good examples of this, and New Brunswick falls into this category as well, um, have a good sense as to the exact number of students. Uh, and for different reasons. I think in Newfoundland, because it's a single program, that up until a couple of years ago, uh, I guess about 18 months ago, was run directly out of the Ministry of Education. In the case of BC, because there are funding provisions tied to it, um, you know, but this is sort of the, the state of affairs that we're in. And it's a consistent state of affairs. So as you can see here now, um, you know, the first estimate of the number of students involved in distance or online uh, learning was one that the Canadian Teachers Federation did back in uh, for the 99-2000 school year. And at the time, they estimated that were, there were about 25,000. And it's kind of interesting because the exact same year there was an estimate done by Tom Clark in the United States, and they actually only had 50,000 uh, was the estimate at that point in the U.S. So um, while they're 10 times the size of us, they only had two times the number of distance ed students. And once we hit sort of that 2011-2012 time period, you see the number actually hasn't changed all that much. It's always been within about 100,000 uh, students of each other. And in terms of percentage, it's actually varied pretty much within 1% of each other, 1.1 to be exact, from 2011-2012 to the most recent school year that we have data for. In terms of blended learning, one of the things that we've uh, tried to do this year, and this is the first year we really tried to get some systematic data on it. Um, and this is fairly problematic because blended learning, and Randy usually talks a little bit about this in, in his section, but um, I'll steal a bit of his thunder here now. Blended learning has very many different definitions depending upon who you ask. Um, and because of that, I think that many of the uh, jurisdictions that we're looking into, um, at least at the ministerial level, so at the provincial or territorial level, really don't have a good sense or a good definition of what exactly is blended learning. And because of that, um, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, I mean just that they could give me six different examples that are six very different looking programs and say, 
they can understand the arguments of calling each of those things blended learning and to try to come up with a list of descriptions or a definition that would capture all of those programs um, is next to impossible and because of that it is very difficult to collect that kind of data when you have a hard time of, of even um, you know defining and describing it in a definitive way. Um, but in terms of just you know between the information that we're getting from some of the individual programs as well as the information that we are getting from the ministries themselves, this is our best estimates and, and actually I'd say best guesstimate as to what we have here. And just to give you a, a better sense of this, um, you know, here's what we were able to collect over the past three years as we looked at it. And it's important to note all of the asterisks that are there and, um, you know, get a sense as to where the data comes from. So in some cases, it is literally just an extrapolation that we're making uh, based on, on LMS data. In some cases, the ministry is giving us a specific data. But again, that data, depending upon how it's collected, um, you know, varies significantly. As you can see, in some cases, we're using just the data we're collecting from the individual program survey and uh, pretty much across the board in some jurisdictions like PEI, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Nineveh, or Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, we just don't have a number at all to put there because we really, it would be like throwing a dart at a dartboard in terms of trying to, to even assign some semblance of a number there. Um, so this gives you, I guess, a sense as to a, a, a you know, really overview of where we are with the study and what it looks like. In terms of the 2017 study in particular and, and all the data that we have came from there, in addition to sort of the national update, there is, um, I believe, if I remember correctly, two new brief issue papers that were in there uh, for that. And those are those uh, three to five page uh, items that tend to tackle an issue around uh, e-learning um, and look at it in a more in-depth way. There were seven additional vignettes. We like to try to include um, a vignette from each of the uh, 14 provinces, territories in the federal jurisdiction. The most we've ever gotten in any single report is, I think, 11. Um, so that's one of the areas in which we could improve upon. As you can see, we only had a 50% uh, response to our call this time. But the vignettes are essentially looking at how some of the policies or activity are actually put into practice at the local level. So to give you an example, um, the vignette this past year from Newfoundland uh, was presented by the uh, guidance counselor for the online program because while most physical schools have a guidance counselor, many online schools, actually most online schools don't. And so looking at what is the role of a guidance counselor in a K-12 online environment and the vignettes tend to be about 250 to 350 words, so about a page printed. Um, provide sort of a nice um, look at, at what's happening. And uh, the sort of main things that we've been doing over the past year in terms of, of the website um, is we've been trying to do a little bit more blogging on the website so that we are able to provide some commentary about K-12 online learning in Canada more than just in an annual report. Um, but most importantly, uh, some of our partners, in particular LEARN and uh, CFED, although in many cases individual jurisdictions um, have actually been providing this. And I won't name specific ones because some have said that we can name them, some have said that we can't, but many of the ministries of education themselves, when asked, have gone in and we've created a French language version of the website that can be gotten off of the main uh, page. and. In that case, uh, we've had people going in and translating both the 2016 and the 2017 uh, versions of the individual provincial and ter ter sorry, territorial profiles, uh, which is something that uh, we're quite proud of because this being the 10th anniversary edition, this is also the first time that we've ever provided any French language content 
as part of this annual study. So um, not being uh, a French speaker myself, um, it is something that uh, I look at with a, a great deal of pride and satisfaction that we're finally able to reach out to and engage with those constituencies. Um, so as you can see, the French part of the site is just over here on the far uh, right hand side when you're looking at the menu items on the top and um, we're hoping that in the next month or so we might even have a full translation of the 2017 report available that we can send to our publisher so that they can uh, republish the uh, 10th anniversary edition uh, as a French language report. And uh, you can see here an example of one of the profiles that has been translated for us. And um, most of them are done now. I think there's two that we still don't have translations for. And as you can see across the bottom of the screen here, and I'm sure Randy will put the green arrow up in a second because I have a suspicion he's the one doing that. Um, you can see that the um, website is available at k12soTn.ca. So I believe that's all for my part, and I'm going to hand this over to Randy here now to talk about some of the specifics that he's been seeing um, or that we've been seeing uh, across the country so that we can, uh, I guess, put a bit of meat on the skeleton that I've just provided you. Thanks, Mark. I'm wondering if we can just go back to this particular slide when we start looking at the list of blended and, and maybe engage some questions. Uh, with this part before I get into my anecdotal commentary and quali qualitative, so to speak. Um, the, the idea about a central LMS, I think, is really pivotal when you, when you look at this. So Ontario can report a large number of uh, students in this kind of an area in terms of the, the increase because it tracks uh, student registrations in the LMS. But just because a student has a uh, registration of record in the LMS doesn't mean they're necessarily taking a course online. Uh, as well, and the smaller programs as well are in the s same sort of circumstances, so it's an individual program, whereas provincially they're just tracking uh, in an LMS that, that uh, a whole number of school districts are contributing to. So is there a little bit more on the blended sort of data that we've been able to collect, Michael? And maybe some questions from folks here. I see Adrian typing, so I assume that's a question coming. Um, I don't know if you wanted me to say anything else on it, Randy, or not. No, just to, to sort of engage a little bit of discussion about that. Just when, when people see numbers on a pay, piece of paper, um, they tend to think that they're hard fast. And it, this is just, I would suggest, uh, giving a, a start of a sampling. Uh, yeah, they can, Adrian. Um, but maybe Michael, you can explain what uh, the Tilo folks in Ontario have provided in terms of data for that led into. Yeah, I mean, literally, they are li just uh, as Randy indicated, a user in an LMS. And and what will often happen, um, particularly in jurisdictions like uh, well, the two that he pointed out were Newfoundland and Ontario. Um, if I'm a face-to-face -face teacher in some school, I could literally say to the, um, you know, to, uh, actually it's a form I fill out, and I say, okay, here's my list of students and, you know, whatever student identification thing that they're using, and I would like a course shell created for, you know, grade 10 history, grade 10 Canadian history. And in the case of Ontario, or if it's a high school course in Newfoundland, because they already have the content created uh, for it, I can even ask them to populate that, that shell, essentially, with the provincially created content. And now, all of a sudden, you know, my class of 30 have accounts in the system. That doesn't necessarily mean that I actually follow through and do anything with that. It just means now I have the ability to do that. Um, and in some cases, um, you know, you have teachers that at the beginning of the year uh, with grand ideas will go in and actually start to, you know, plan out these kinds of activities. But then, you know, as the uh, 
um, normal stresses of a school year start, and this is something that they may not have done before. So it requires a little bit additional planning and preparation. And as time crunches become, um, you know, evident, all of a sudden that just sits there and, um, you know, doesn't get used for the entire time. So while they're still counted as a user, um, they're not necessarily an active user. And, and that's one of the, the difficulties that um, we have. I, I see Greg has uh, asked a question about definitions of, of blended learning and, and whether or not there's been a discussion around that. And uh, there hasn't been any at the, the national level. And I think one of the reasons for that is simply because um, education is a provincial jurisdiction and, and most conversations that will happen at the national level tend to be much bigger in, um, in terms of sort of the finite policy kinds of things around an issue like that. Uh, the other thing is that um, in all honesty I'm not necessarily sure that the practitioners in the field are really interested in that kind of discussion. I know in the case of Alberta, when Alberta Ed brought uh, new people into their uh, into the ministry there, that were focused uh, specifically upon online and blended learning. And one of the things that they were interested in doing was essentially starting to come up with some definitions around this. And I think from the ministry perspective, it may have been definitions so that they could better. Um, support the systems that were in place. Uh, one of the things I know that came from the field itself, from the practitioners in the field, was they were quite resistant to coming up with any sort of solid or definitive definition of both what you know blended was and to a lesser extent what online was. To, excuse me, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, which I thought was a, an interesting thing. Um, you know, I, Randy, when often when we do these sessions, talks about how in many cases definitions are um, used in a regulatory fashion for funding reasons. And um, you know, if you have a jurisdiction that's funding online or blended learning differently than it's funding face-to-face uh, -face learning, then definitions become very important. If you have a jurisdiction like most throughout the country where funding for students are the same regardless if they're in a face-to-face -face or an online environment, uh, definitions become less important to the practitioners in the field. I don't know if right. you want to add to that, Randy. Yeah, yeah if I can jump in and, and uh, noting Adrian, uh, who's uh, BC-based as well. Um, my argument in BC has been that distributed learning, as the online programs are, are called, and uh, also in policy, but they're funded through distributed learning policy and funding. Uh, so distributed learning is really just that, a policy funding. It doesn't really describe the practice because the practices are strictly online at a distance or they are a, a mix-up uh, of both some face-to-face -face or even um, within district um, uh, students. Uh, and a lot of them have embedded teachers now in high school programs so that teachers are teaching out of a local school and they have a mix of online classes and others and the students come from all over whether they may even actually be in their own local school. So practices, uh, it becomes very difficult to, to, to do that. Um, if you look on uh, in the, I forget which, uh, where we put it, but that whole discussion, Michael, about why we use the term e-learning uh, here and I just finished reading a piece about digital learning in terms of as a as a term to describe this kind of activity uh, is is they, the the terms become outdated so even blended learning activity in it of itself is is a bit misleading because uh, one of the reasons that Alberta pursued a different definition of blended is because they used that term in the province in the past to describe uh, programs where parents and teachers were both teaching the students, so they called that blended. Uh, so there was a drive in Alberta to try to decide that we're going to use this to mean online learning activity as opposed to parental activity. So anyway, any definition uh, has a best before due date, and I would suggest to you that I'm now seeing, in my mind at least, blended is, is becoming problematic as a term to define. To go back to your comment, Greg, uh, in post-secondary they use hybrid as well. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, 
and it's, it, terms become problematic. I'd rather describe practice. So to me, it's really a lot. And so we, when we adopted the name of the, the, the network, it became CAN eLearn was what we adopted, which morphed into C Canadian eLearning Network. So to draw some level of consistency between what this network of people was about uh, and the research, uh, we've shifted to use the term e-learning uh, as a generic sort of term, not as widely used and has been around for a few years. So that's sort of my take on definitions, unless you get more to add, Mike. Nothing more for me. Uh, as Randy indicated, I've posted the uh, the brief issue paper that we wrote on how we decided to operationalize or define e-learning, and uh, we're fortunate enough to have that available both in French and in English. Um, and it goes through and talks about some of the other terms. Um, Randy mentioned digital learning as an example, and that's one that we've uh, seen used as part of the keeping pace reports that come out of the U.S., which are essentially the American equivalent to what we've been doing with the state of the nation. So I'll let you get back to these observations here, Randy. Sure, thanks. And just, uh, Greg, just uh, for your notification as well, is that uh, Tony Bates, who's been doing the surveys for post-secondary, the level of online learning and, and enrollments that are happening, and we've had several discussions with him, uh, Tony, as well as uh, um, Tricia Donovan, who has picked up on doing some of the major work, and they're launching their second survey actually just now. They're using digital learning as the term at this point in time as well, and have been. Um, so a couple of observations across Canada, so to speak. Um, and let's see, I think I can do it this way. Yeah, okay, so trending uh, in here is sort of where we're we looking for some research. We really just have sort of a, a gradation of, of practices, both online and classroom based. So blended is kind of, we use the term to describe sort of a mashup between the two. Yeah, good, Greg. Um, but it really is more about uh, online has become more personalized. So it's instead of one to many, which is a typical classroom group, I teach to the, the norm, I teach to the group, uh, I deal with exceptions within that, but all of my thinking and, and setup as a science teacher was about uh, getting, you know, demonstration to students as a group in the room and then going around and helping out with individuals, whereas online tends to be one-to-one. Uh, -one. So it tends to be uh, an individual interaction with content and teacher and peers for students. Um, when you take that and expand that out into the classroom type of level, what we've seen a lot of uh, classroom-based in schools are doing is, is building into partnerships with communities uh, and elsewhere. And so the flexibility that is being created around um, a lot of programs, the, the shifts in curriculum, the shifts in, in more personalized learning and competency learning approaches uh, have have sort of enabled a lot more use and leverage of technology to support some of the core content and, and notional areas. So uh, I like the terms blended and blurred as being more descriptive of uh, this type of thing. So there's been some programs that have sort of emerged in that kind of an approach. So in BC, Navigate, Navigate Nights has been one that has been uh, quite interesting. Um, as well in Alberta, there's been some partnerships uh, and other things that are occurring. In Ontario, um, it's, it tends to be a little bit more structured around courses and centralized, but there is a lot more practice that is starting to become personalized and uh, mixed up in a lot of specific schools. And I've seen some really great examples of that in uh, some of the Ottawa Catholic School District as well. Um, and in Quebec, uh, they were very much on the, their online practice at Learn was very much synchronous um, in specific times and approaches, and they're moving to more asynchronous, gamified types of approaches to make it again more personalized. So there's been that kind of a, a, a trend that's that's happening through there. And, and Michael, jump in with any comments as, as we're doing that, and I'll track uh, your comments, uh, folks. Just put it in the chat area, or if you want to speak, just raise your hand because we want to kind of open it up a little bit more dialogue. So as we know, education is pretty much uh, siloed across Canada when you start to looking at a pan-Canadian approach. 
except the silos aren't all the same size. So a couple of significant differences is part of, we've explored some of these relationships, um, is that uh, resources for online programs, whether you be classroom based or in a virtual school or distance education program, whatever the case is. So when you look at and sort of sum up across, so you've got provincial programs in the smaller provinces and territories. You've got a mix of provincial and district that occurs in some of the others uh, as well. But it, interestingly, in, there, there is no Ministry of Education produced resources specific or courses specific to online programs in BC or Alberta. Uh, arguably, Alberta has a mixed provincial district, but ADLC, which is their provincial program, is going through yet again another uh, revision uh, and reset of itself. And a few years back, Alberta Education uh, actually commissioned a review of, of distance education in the province, uh, really centering on the elephant in the room to, and from their perspective was, well, we got this provincial program called ADLC, should that be the only program? Uh, and BC has been asking the same question in some of their reviews. So it's an interesting juxtaposition to what's happening. So when I go back and look at the nature of activity, I, I think what's happening in Ontario, Quebec, and BC and Alberta uh, it shines a light on, on, on kind of what's happening in Canada because there tends to be this kind of Western or Eastern kind of view and, and the other programs are usually just run by the Ministry of Education. So you don't get any of the dynamics that seem to be happening in those two provinces. I don't know whether, Michael, you want to add some comments just on that notion <clears throat> before I explore it. Okay. Yeah, let me hang myself. I like it. Um, so, so in Quebec, Learn Quebec is funded and gets some funding from the Provincial Ministry of Education. Has a bit of a, it, its own approach and, and to deal with Anglophone uh, students in, in the province. REFAD is um, focusing mainly on adults, but again, gets some provincial uh, funding and support to, to do that. So it tends to be a little bit more centralized and, and in Ontario is the most centralized where the resources are produced by the provincial uh, ministry. They second teachers and program coordinators to come in and build courses for them. Uh, and they've gone, uh, the same thing happens with CFORC for the Francophone. Uh, some of these are shared uh, uh, across Canada, but there's a, uh, there's a, a commodification of them. Uh, they're free inside of the province, but outside of the province, there's, there's, there's a financial cost to that. But what's also interesting about Ontario, for both the Francophone and Anglophone, is that they also provide the licenses to the learning management system. And that was just for the online programs before, but they got uh, tremendous pressure from teachers in classrooms. So now it's, it's wide open. So that's why, uh, Adrian, the comment about the LMS, uh, the data for how many student accounts are, comes from the LMS. Whether they're active or not depends on the individual school the district. Uh, and or programs. So it's it's an interesting situation, but they, they've had a two-fold or three-fold increase in the number of accounts uh, in Desire to Learn, which is a provincial LMS. Uh, so it's starting to happen in the classrooms a lot more as well. <clears throat> um, when you look at the rest of Canada having some sort of a provincial focus around online courses, uh, where Alberta and BC does not, Alberta ADLC does produce its own courses and does share under certain conditions and limitations. But ADLC funding goes through one of the school divisions in the province. So there tends to be a little bit of a restrictedness to the resources. Plus when ADLC creates its own content, there are third party content licenses to be dealt with. So it's very difficult uh, in some cases to share that and in BC the same way. So while I mentioned ADLC has the provincial focus, um, What's happened in Alberta is the Moodle Hub has, has been created, uh, hosted by Rocky uh, School, School Division, and they're trying to share actual courses and materials because they basically the provinces moved towards everyone using Moodle for the most part as the LMS. So it's not a centralized LMS, but at least there's a hub that's been created where some of the content and courses could be shared within the province. Uh, what happened in BC, they did the same thing. It was cool school before, but they began to, you know, as a consortium to start to share 
some of their materials and and some of the the, the lessons and 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 courses there so but there was a commodification you have to pay money from your school district to join bclm well that notion has now expanded to make them the western canada learning network so they've got Yukon and three Alberta divisions, and they're looking and talking with folks in Saskatchewan to share, again, content, because it's not being necessarily produced for them provincially through the ministry like it is in Ontario. So that's one of the other the interesting uh, notions that's, that is occurring across Canada. The other thing that's interesting, and again, it's in BC and Alberta, um, they feel the need to create sort of an identity around blended uh, learning approaches and options so BlendEd Alberta is a nonprofit that's registered, and they now have been supporting. This is the, I think it's the third or fourth annual uh, conference that they do, a uh, symposium, where they bring teachers together and uh, program uh, leaders together in uh, a central place annually to discuss blended approaches, courses of contents, practices, etc. And interestingly enough, BC has followed suit now, and this is a newly formed a group, um, not at the nonprofit status, but again, feeling the need that's important to reflect the notion of what classroom teachers are doing as well as online teachers uh, there. So again, to go back to trending, um, you know, the practices are blurring, they're kind of all over the place. It's a personalized approach, maybe some competency built in, but uh, for us here, I think the critical piece is a research focus on getting better data and exploring some of these pockets of innovation is really a, a sort of a key takeaway and a message that, that we come back for uh, within this. So that's my kind of cross Canada uh, overview uh, at this point. And we really, I think we want to open it up for questions at this point, really, um, from you, yourselves and others. Michael, any final comments? No, questions sound good to me. Okay, great. That's the, uh, the presentation for today's session. And that's um, Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte. We're now going to Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to post them in the chat or to grab the microphone. You'll find the microphone button in the top bar. Click it once to turn it on. Click it again to turn it off to avoid any echoes or feedback. So thanks for your comment, Donald. Uh, I would be interested to see what direction Manitoba is going in terms of its review. Uh, and one of the things I think that through Canny Learn I'd like to to see is where we could share some of these uh, reviews that are going on in the provinces across um, in, in terms of as a practitioner level as well as obviously at the ministerial level. Um, but I'm hoping, Donald, that you're also in contact with some of the your your partners in crime in the western provinces as well if not i can certainly be happy if you send me an email to could, uh, connect you uh, as well for if you're not talking with daylene or you're not talking with mario uh in alberta and bc uh, or joanna in saskatchewan certainly um, would encourage you to connect with them any comments from folks Yes, and while we wait for questions and comments, uh, I'd just like to say, you know, it's it's great to see uh, the development. Um, for me here in BC, uh, since the early days of the Connect program, uh, back in the, about the year 2000, and all the uh, development that's been going on. And that takes us back to the idea of defining uh, what uh, e-learning or blended learning is, because, um, you know, definitions can, I think, uh, restrict innovation and experimentation. So it, it's good to see a little bit of pushback there. And, and Greg, I'm, I, if you have not gone on, uh, there's uh, there was a tweet. Let me see if I can find uh, the link. Uh, Tony Bates has just put something out um, relative to the work that they're doing. Um, no, it's not there. Anyway, I, if I find it, I will. It, it was just tweeted out too, uh, in terms of the survey. So check out Contact North as well. You might be interested to see, uh, catch up with what they're doing there in terms of their survey.
Okay, not seeing anyone typing or, well, okay, great, there you go, thanks. <laughs> yeah, okay, actually, yeah, and if you, you'll probably see it. If you look up Tricia Donovan uh, in Twitter, um, I forget what her Twitter handle is now, uh, but she was, she repeated his tweet that just came out or check with, with at Dr. At, at Dr. Bates, uh, his email handle, you'll, or Twitter handle, you'll be able to see. Okay, if that's it, Dan, over to you. Okay, um, yes, I'm sure people will be uh, reading the report and we'll probably have uh, questions based on that. And uh, hopefully they can get in contact you. I see the, uh, the addresses are there on the screen, so uh, people will be able to get contact with you uh, with any questions they may have uh, as they go through the report. And I am sure uh, that uh, things are looking good for next year's report as well. Getting there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, finalizing the sponsors, hopefully this week or so, getting the instruments finalized through the sponsors, uh, next week, starting the actual data collection the week after. Great. It's always a, a good to have that as a resource. All right. So, uh, yes, uh, we this presentation it has been recorded and it will be available on our site, cider.athabascu.ca, in about an hour. You can also find the slides there, as well as a link to the report uh, in our archives. Once again, uh, we have an open call for anyone who has research that they would like to share in our next season, which uh, we will be back in September. Uh, we expect to be back in September and we'll have 10 sessions next year. So if you have an idea for a session, send us a note and uh, give us an idea of what you'd like to present to our audience. Once again, thank you to our presenters today, Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte. And, uh, and can he learn as well, um, has a, a lot of interesting resor resources and has been a great uh, connection for us here at CIDR. Thank you everyone and thanks to CIDR for the continued support over the years.